Aren't you glad God doesn't demand that you're perfect? He doesn't demand that you're perfect to come to him. He said, come to me, then I'll make you perfect. That's, that's man, that's good. Don't try to get Charles Spurgeon. I don't remember exactly how he said it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it and put my identity in there with it. I know what he was saying. I'm going to say it the way I'd say it. You don't get holy to get to God. You come to God, He makes you holy. You see what I'm saying? Most people have the mindset of, when I get good enough, I'll come to God. Because right now, I don't have access to Him because of what my life looks like. That's backwards. That's a lie from hell. You come to him the way you are, and then he starts to change you. I, I know it's become cliche, come to him just like you are. Come to Jesus like you are. And the problem I have with that is people think it's okay to stay that way. It's not okay to stay like you are. I don't care what level you're on. I don't care how much word you have. I don't, I don't care what you've done concerning spiritual things. It's still not okay to stay where you are. Because you still have a lot of growing to do. That song Josh was singing, talking about the vastness of God and how he did it all for you. Don't tell me you've arrived. <laughs> He's a big old God. We, we don't even scratch the surface. We could spend our lifetime studying the deep things of God and never scratch the surface. You know, your knowledge of the Word doesn't necessarily change you. What theologian knows the Word better than the devil does? But he's still a devil. He knows the Word backward and forward. But he's still a devil. So it's not your knowledge of the word that changes you. It's your application of the word that changes you. Hallelujah. So it's not about what you know. It's what you've applied. It's what you've applied. It's that when you find that word, that, that, that scripture that the Lord reveals to you, and you say, that's mine, and now you move into it, and you start making it that the anthem of your life, and you start walking in the truth of that word. That's what changes you. Yeah. Yeah. That's what changes you. That, and that's what Cole was talking about. That's the truth that, that cuts lies. That's the truth that makes you free. The truth shall make you free. But it's not the knowledge of the truth. It's not even the speaking of the truth. It's the application of the truth. So when I get the word of God, which is truth, Jesus said, Father, thy word is truth. When I get the word of truth and I get revelation of truth, it'll make me want to jump around and shout, but it doesn't change me. The application of truth changes me. The me coming into alignment with the truth changes me. Does that make sense? Me learning the truth doesn't do anything. That's knowledge. And when I die, knowledge dies with me. Everything that I've learned cerebral will die with me. And I'll take it to the grave. But the things that I have applied to my life go into eternity with me. I remember Brother Holton saying, saying that the Lord spoke to him one time and said, what do you want? He said, I want to live forever. He said, then line up with my word because my word's eternal. Woo! So whatever is in my life that is not in alignment with the word does not come into eternity with me. Uh -huh. Only the things that... The, the parts of my life that have come into alignment with the word because now they're in alignment with the word 
Now they become eternal. Does that make sense yes. to you? Yes. So what is that called? When I come into alignment with the Word. What is that? The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And given to Him was a name that's above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to, that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when I come into alignment with the Word, I come into alignment with Jesus, right? He is the Word. I am now in Christ. Now, 7,500 plus promises are yes and amen. Why? Because I'm in Christ. And that's where the blessing of God is, is in Christ. Outside of Christ, there is no blessing, only curse. But when I come into alignment with the word, see why applying the word is so vital? Because if I'm not applying the word to my life, I cannot say I'm in Christ. If I'm not in Christ, I have no righteousness. I am the righteousness of God. What's the rest of that scripture? In Christ. So if I'm in Christ, I have been encapsulated in the righteousness of God. And I'm worthy to stand in front of him. Because I'm just as righteous as Jesus. But if I'm not, I'm there on my own merit. Dear Lord, I don't want to stand in front of God on my own merit. So see why coming into alignment with the word, why applying the word. Why do I have these clothes on? Are you all glad I have these clothes on? Yes. Why? How did I get them on? I applied them to myself. I had to come into alignment with them. I had to align my arms in a way that fit these sleeves. Right? I had to align my legs where they fit these legs and these jeans. I had to come into alignment. I had to conform myself to these clothes. That's what I have to do to the word. Put on. I have to put on Christ. Put on the whole armor of God. Well, what is it? It's the word. Because if now if I'm in Christ, if I've applied the word, what have I done? I have the shield of faith. I have the breastplate of righteousness. I have the helmet of salvation. I have the sword of the spirit. My feet are shod with the preparation of peace. My loins are girded with truth. You see, I put the word on because I've come into alignment with the word. I can't put it on if I'm not in alignment with it. You know what I've come to realize? I'm not preaching that message. Again. You can't get better than this anyway. Wow. Again, here we go. But I am. It, I am, but I'm not. But it's about coming into alignment with the word. It's about coming into alignment with the word. So when I come into the alignment with, alignment with the word, it is not about me. It is not about me. That's, what we, that's been the theme of our week. I don't want to do this, but it ain't about me. No. Because there's a lot of things that I don't want to do. How about you? Yeah. You have anything you don't want to do? Uh -huh. I got a lot of stuff I don't want to do. But it's not about me. And the further we go in ministry, that's what I come to realize. Because ministry involves people. And I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about new people. I don't, I don't, I'm not a mingler. You know what I mean? I'm not the guy that walks in the room and by the end of the night I know everybody. I'm the guy that walks in the room, I'll stand over here by myself and I'll watch everybody. But I don't mingle. You know what I mean? But... In ministry, I have to do that, and it takes me so far out of my comfort zone. But I have to constantly remind myself, it ain't about me. But I don't like doing this, but it's not about me. I don't like making phone calls, but it ain't about me. You follow me? Yep. I don't like, look, I don't like going out of town. I don't. Natalie can attest to that. I don't like leaving home. I want to be home every night. But I got to tell myself, it ain't about me. It has nothing to do about where I want to be. It's about where I need to be. It ain't about what I want to do. It's about what I should do. It ain't about any, look, it ain't about what I want to say. It's about what I'm supposed to be saying. So I have to be where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there doing what I'm supposed to do and how I feel about it don't matter. 
here's the, here's the catch. With who I'm supposed to be with. Whether I like it or not. And it's not just me. It's you. If you are in Christ, then you've got to be where he is. You can't walk independently. You've got to go where he says we're going. This is where we're going. Well, you know what? If I say, I don't want to go there, he's still going. Am I going to remain in him? Then I have to go with him. Because if my pants and my shirt say, we're going over there, and I want to remain in them, I got to go with them. You follow that? I know that's... That's a stretch, but I think it paints a picture. I've got to remain in Christ in spite of how I feel. But I just feel, I just need to rest a while. Well, I can. And Jesus moves on. I just feel like I need a break. Well, I can take one. But I might miss out on where I was supposed to be. I might miss out on who I was supposed to meet with. I might miss out on the opportunity to say what I was supposed to say because I was concerned with how I feel and I was taking a break. Who I just, I just want to say. I, I just want to say how I feel about that. I just want to say what I think about that. Well, I can. And I have that freedom. But I don't mean I'm supposed to. Amen. You know, there's a lot of things I like to say <laughs> on a lot of subjects. Because I'm a very opinionated person. And I've got an opinion on just about everything. But that don't mean I'm supposed to share it. You got that? Yeah. Let that sink in. That don't mean I'm supposed to post it. Now come on. I had to learn that. When I first got that Facebook thing, I thought because they shared their opinion, I was supposed to comment on it. And I stirred up a lot of stinky stuff. Because it's so obvious how wrong they are. <laughs> ah, Lord. God loves you. Yes. God loves you. God loves you. Let him reveal to you just how much. He loves you. I'm talking to you personally. You. He loves you in a way that you can't even imagine. How much does he love you? This is what the cross said. I love you so much, I'd rather die than be without you. God said that to you. That's what the cross said. I would rather die. This, look, look. This is God. Think about God for just a minute. Omnipotent, all power, all power. Omniscient, he's everywhere. All knowing, he knows everything. <laughs> he knows everything. He knows all your secrets that maybe nobody else knows. God knows them. He has all power. He is sovereign, so he has all authority. And he loves you anyway. He doesn't love you because of what he can get from you. He doesn't love you for what you can provide. People do that. He doesn't love you because of how good you've been to him. He loves you because he loves you. 
He loves you because you are his child. This is what, this is what gets me because my prayer is always, God, what do you want me to say? God, what do you want me to tell your people? And I get the same answer every time. Tell them I love them. Tell them I love them. Find in Hebrews, Natalie, uh, what I was sharing the other day, and I wish I had my Bible because I would written some, some notes. But you remember what I was sharing about us being children of God? Inasmuch then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That was us, right? For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he gives aid to the seed of Abraham. Everybody say, that's me. Therefore, what do we do when we find out, there, read therefore the word? We find out what it's there for. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. He had to be, who had to be made? Capital H. Jesus had to be made like his what? His what? What's he call us? He Jesus yeah. called me his brother? Yeah. Jesus called you his brother? Uh -huh. Now, this is what I want to point out from this passage. I've heard all about how we are adopted into the body of Christ. We're adopted. We're adopted. Okay, I get it. I understand that. But what about what I just read? That we're partakers of flesh and and blood. Yeah. Now, I'm not a stepchild. I'm not a stepchild. He said, flesh and blood. Inasmuch then as the children, is that me? Partake, have partaken of flesh and blood. He himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that is the devil, and release those, that would be us, who through fear of death, because of, apart from Christ, I better be fearful of death. Yeah. Yeah. In Christ, I have no reason to fear death. But if I'm not in Christ, death is a very, very, uh, uh, a thing that I should be very afraid of. But he released those through fe who, those who had fear of death, and all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Have you ever been in bondage? Oh, yeah. He just said he released you. Mm -hmm. He said he released you from bondage, bondage of your past, the bondage of addiction, the bondage of sickness, the bondage of debt. He said he released you. What he said was, I opened the gate. If you stay in the pen, that's your fault. Yeah. He yeah. said, but I opened the gate. Uh -huh. Welcome through. That reminds me of the other day when I walked outside and the gate was wide open. And my horse was supposed to be in there. And Jonathan had taken him roping, to a roping the night before. So I went and got him up. I said, hey, the gate's open. He said, okay. I said, where's my horse? Oh, he's in there. I'm glad you're confident he's in there. He said, that's Duck. He ain't going anywhere. Sure enough, I walk in there. He's standing in the stall. Now, where could he have been? Anywhere. 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 It reminds me of us. Sometimes we get so comfortable. Why did he not go anywhere? Because he's comfortable where he's at. Or did, did you catch that? He's comfortable where he's at. Sometimes we get so comfortable where we're at, we don't realize the gate's wide open, and we could go anywhere. What could he have enjoyed had he walked out the gate? He could have enjoyed anybody's garden. 
he could have enjoyed this whole sack of feed sitting under the carport. He could have enjoyed all kinds of things, but he never walked out of the gate. Now, I'm glad he didn't walk out of the gate, but I'm telling you, you need to walk out the gate. Yeah. I'm telling you because the word said, you're free. free. He said, you're free. Yes. He said, that, that yoke around your neck, it's broken. But if you want to carry it around with you, that's okay. I'll let you, but you don't have to. He said, I made you free. What else did he say? You ought to have that highlighted. That's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. And to release those who were subject through fear and bondage. You have fear? He said he released you from it. You've been released from fear. I'm here to uh, announce to you he released you from fear. What causes you fear? You know what? You know why God detests fear so so much? Now I'm a, I'm about to, to. This might be kind of shocking to you, but I want you to see the picture. You know why God despises fear? Because you know what fear does? Fear makes you go to the cross of a suffering Savior, climb up and get eye to eye with Him, and say you're a liar. Because for me to get bound by fear, I have to say that the word of God is not true concerning me. So therefore, I have to say Jesus is a liar because I'm believing what's threatening me more than I believe him. Because that truthfully is the only way I can get in fear. If he's promised that no weapon formed against me will prosper. And if he promised that all things are going to work together for my good, and if he promised me he'll never leave me nor forsake me, and if he promises me he supplies all of my needs, and if he promised me he gives me the desires of my heart, then what do I have to be afraid of? So the only way I can get in fear is to believe that one of them things ain't true. He said he released you from fear. So why are we bound by fear? We were at a service not long ago, not here, somewhere else, and I was asked to come to the altar to pray for people, and hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people, came to the altar, and I probably laid my hand on 20 or so that night, and out of the 20, about 18 said, would you pray with me about fear? These were Christian people. This, this, was not, this was not people who were getting saved. This was, this was the church. So if the church is so bound by fear, how do we ever plan to advance and take, take ground from the kingdom of darkness if we're bound by fear already? When the word of God says, I've released you from fear. I have set you free from fear. I've already given you victory over fear. I've already dealt with everything that could possibly bring you fear. I've already conquered it. Don't get bound by fear. Now, I'm say, am I saying that fear doesn't rise up? Of course fear is going to rise up. You're a human. But you don't let it demobilize you. You don't let it keep you up at night. You don't let it steal your happiness during the day. You don't let it rob you of your joy. You take it and you let it motivate you, saying if, if, if the devil wants to stir me up like this, he must have a reason to try to stop me, and then you make it push you forward all the more. So you harness it and you put it to work for you. That's what you do with fear. You harness it and you put it to work for you rather than it working against you. Do you. Does that make sense to you? So if I can get this working for me, and I recognize that if I am having this feeling of fear come over me, it must be the devil trying to stop me, because I know what the Word of God says concerning me. So now, because I feel this fear coming on, I'm running at it all the faster. That's, 
kind of what we do with resistance. If things come go easy, I start to get really concerned. And I start thinking that maybe God ain't in this. Does that make sense? That sounds backwards. But the reality is when God calls me to do something and I start moving to it, the devil always comes at me with resistance. And if that resistance don't come, I start back and say, wait a minute. Is this really what God's called me to do? Or is this the natural approach because it's the easy way out? And I've got to question myself. It says, for indeed, he doesn't give aid to angels, but he gives his aid to the seed of Abraham. That's me. That's you, that's me. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So just, let's just praise the Lord. Right hand. <laughs> Y'all want to do the whole song? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Therefore, in all things, he had to be like the, his brethren. That he might be merciful and faithful, a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make appropriation for the sins of the people. What was he saying? He had to be made like you so he could understand you. It said, likewise, he had to be made like the brethren. So the things that they're tested in, the things that they're tempted to do, the struggles they have, he would face the same ones so that he could understand them, so that he could have compassion for them, so that he could sympathize with them, but also to be an example to show them that they're not subject to the natural laws of this world. But they are actually victorious in all things because he conquered all things. And he remained sinless. Everything you've been tempted to do, he was like, likewise tempted to do, yet remained sinless. Just so he could understand you. He sub subjected himself to the same trials and the same temptations. So there's nothing you're going through that he hasn't been through. So there's nothing you're going through that he can't completely sympathize with. Well, he was never fatherless. How can he sympathize with me? Really? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was he saying? Now I know what the fatherless feel like, and I can sympathize with them. Now I know what the rejected and the outcast feel like, and now I can sympathize. He can't sympathize with me. I had this temptation for drug, drug use. He don't know what that felt like, really. He said, on the cross. They took a sponge and they soaked it in pain-relieving medication. And they offered it up to him. And he turned his head away from it. He doesn't know what it's like to go through what I'm going through. Really? In all ways was he tempted. In every way. Well, he wasn't tempted with women. He was Jesus. Really? He was Jesus. He was Jesus. And the anointing is very attractive. The anointing is very attractive. So people were drawn. Women were drawn. He doesn't get it descriptive in the word. But I guarantee you, there were offers made.
Although I don't believe he looked like the Fabio we see portray him on TV with the flowing blonde hair and the big old blue eyes, because I do understand that he was from the Middle East. I bet he was much a man. Because the very fact that he was a carpenter should show us he wasn't a weakling. Carpenters today wasn't like carpenters, aren't like carpenters back then. Because he didn't have his truck to go to, to Stein's to pick up a load of lumber. He had, yeah, he had his two hands in his back. And he went and he found a tree. And he cut it down and drug it home. And he milled it himself with very primitive tools. And nails that were made in fire. And there was no nail gun. And there was no skill saw. And you know what? When the cabinet was built, when the desk was made, when the furniture was all assembled, he couldn't call, even call a delivery truck. He had a donkey, maybe. Maybe. So I bet he was pretty well put together. And he was also a pretty sharp dresser. Because they were gambling for his clothes at the foot of the cross, and you don't do that for somebody dressed in rags. It said that, that his garment was one piece tailor-made without a seam. And it was of great value. So he was a well-built man, sharp dresser, full of the anointing. I doubt he wasn't tempted by women. He was rich. <laughs> There's a whole doctrine out there that says he wasn't. Well, it says that kings brought him their treasure, at, they, they laid their treasure at his feet at his birth. And then he traveled, his family traveled into Egypt, and they took an honorage of people with them. There were so many people that they didn't even recognize when they forgot Jesus. Remember that story we talked about a couple weeks ago. So they had all these people, and I can't read anywhere where, G, where Joseph had a traveling carpenter shop. I think from the birth night forward, he didn't drive another nail. Because kings brought treasure and laid them at his feet. Judas was, the, Judas was Jesus' personal treasure. How many broke people have a personal treasure? <laughs> Judas has been stealing the money. Jesus didn't even confront him about it. That's what the whole 30 pieces of silver was about. Judas thinking, you know... I can take this ransom. I can replace the money I stole. Jesus won't know. I've seen him walk through the crowd when they tried to get him. He'll escape again. Not knowing that in a couple of days he would hang himself and fall to the ground and bust open. He loves you. That's what all of that was about. That's what was, think about Jesus and who he is. God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's God. He was there in the beginning. Well, when's the beginning if God's without beginning or without end? I don't know. But he was there. When God spoke the cosmos into being, what did he speak? Word. The Word. Jesus is the Word yeah. made flesh. He was always there in the presence of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were always there. He was God. Jesus gave up heaven to endure everything he went through on earth. Why? 
for you, for me, personally, not even corporately, not even corporately. He didn't say, I'm going to leave the throne and I'm going to go to earth and I'm going to let them treat me like garbage and I'm going to put up with everything that they put up there and I'm, gonna, I'm even going to live without air conditioning. He did that, right? Yeah. I have a hard time believing he was sweating at the throne. Because he wouldn't even let the, key, the, the priest sweat in their underwear to go into the Holy of Holies, so I doubt they're sweating at the throne. So he gave all this up to become a man. Think about that. That's mind-boggling. If you think about the vastness of God and the minuteness of man, that's just mind-boggling. But he was willing to do it. Why? Because he loves you. Then he was willing to endure everything that he went through. Why? Because he loves you. Then he was willing to subject himself to separation from the Father that had never in eternity existed. Why? Because he loves you. Like I said, it's not about corporately because he didn't say, I'm going to do this for all these people because all these people rejected him. So he had to do it for you individually. Because if you were the only one that ever accepted him, he still would have done it. Because at that moment, he didn't know who would receive him. You, you follow what I'm saying? So he did it for you personally, then subjected himself to death and to hell. He went to hell for you. Why? Because he loves you. And then he said, as he walked out, he snatched the keys to death, hell, and the grave, kicked the gate off the hinge, and marched out through Abraham's bosom, leading a parade of old dead saints behind him. It's all in the Word. What did he do it for? For you, because he loves you. So what am I trying to say? He loves you. <laughs> if you missed it, he loves you. Does that mean that he loves the way we act all the time? No. No. But he loves you. Yep. Does that mean when he don't love the way you act, he doesn't receive you anymore? No. no. Because he loves you. Have my kids disappointed me at times? Yeah. Have yours? Yeah. yeah. Did you quit loving them? No. No. Did you correct them? Yeah. yeah. And did you move on? Yeah. Yeah. Did you quit meeting their needs? No. no. Did you quit taking care of them? Did you quit trying to bring out the best in them? No. You didn't give up on them. Why? Because you love them. Now, if Jesus called me his brethren, who's my daddy? Yeah, God. <laughs> if I'm a brother to Jesus, I'm not making that statement myself. He called me that. Yeah. If I'm his flesh and blood brother, like he just said, what's it entitled me to? I've got two boys. What's he entitled to? What's he, th what's he entitled to? Everything I got. What's he entitled to? Everything I got. So if Jesus was entitled to everything that he had and walked in, what am I entitled to? Everything. What are you entitled to? Because why? Because I'm Cause you're a up. flesh and blood child of God. Yeah. I'm a brother to Jesus. Isn't it what it says? I'm a joint heir. Yeah. I'm a joint heir with Christ. Well, what's a joint heir mean? Everything he gets, I get. I'm a joint heir with Christ but only if I'm in Christ. In 